Picture paper. All the world in pictures. Picture paper. Scene number four is running slow. Sales are going up in Canada. Where's those proofs? That's in Ten Point Gill. Catch the night train. Take George. Check. Just take on the page. I told you. Dear sir, your article on cats is a cruel trap. Circulation, one and a half million. Picture paper, all the work, all the world in pictures. Picture paper. Parker, please. Oh, hello, Mona. Is Tom there? Well, tell him the first copy's off and I'm going through it, will you? Ask him to call me back. Thanks. Wedding in Normandy. The war against malaria. So George did get his micro photographs. How to plan your turn? The Tunisian dancer. <laughs> Very good. Mr. Spreadbury the Thatcher. Seems all right. Pretty good issue. Should please everyone. Everyone? Five million everyone. Five million people. Freedom of the press. Every country calls it that. As though it were something in a bottle with a label on it stuck up on a parliamentary shelf. It isn't, you know. It's something much more personal. How to plan your town. That was a good story. I enjoyed doing that. Seems ages ago now, though. Good many other stories since. I talked to those people. Lived with them for a day or two. There's Mrs. Farley. Yes, it seems all right. Now, take the way that story happened. Tuesday, the usual editorial conference. Everybody was there, even the office boy. Morning, Mona. Good morning, Jim. They started already. Yep. What you said about the little ship story, George, you know. Too dark below decks. But the pictures turned out all right. Hello, Jim. Sorry I'm late. Got held up at the ministry. Just talking over the picture possibilities of some trick cyclists Hayward's on to at the local music hall. George is carping about light. You can't photograph an audience without lots of lamps. I'm always telling you. I think you're right, George. The story's no good. Even if it is Hayward's local music hall. The woman's feature well, what are we going to do for a light feature? What about that Tunisian dancer? How's that coming along, Grumpy? Here are some of the pictures. We'll have the rest tomorrow. Yes, they look as though they're going to be good, don't they? Those have got plenty of action. Tom, how about a mining story? We want something uh, serious to balance these Tunisian dancer pictures. Well, I've got a letter from Ironborough. Ironborough in Yorkshire. It's got a town planning scheme. Town planning? Who hasn't? Tom, I really do think we ought to be careful about these planning stories. Yes, you know, someday if these plans don't materialize, Somebody will dig up a copy of the paper and what will they say? You see? Just another press stunt. And they'll have a right to. 
and we'll have a right to go for the politicians if they let us down. But look, meanwhile, we've got five million readers. They pay fourpence a week to read what interests them. What interests them more than the way they live and the way they want to live? But you know as well as I do, Tom, the best of these plans, those worked out with the best intentions, are done in the ivory castles of council chambers. The people aren't there. But they are, Jim. The people must work out their plans if it takes another 20 years. I know something about this. Our has got a fellow called Max Locke. He and a team of young experts are finding out what the people want and not just telling them what the architects want. Sounds all right. Good. You go and see if it is. Tom, I've only just got back. Form your own judgment. If you can't see a story in Ironburg, there are a dozen other towns with plans. And at the end of it, well, we don't have to print a planning story anyway. All right. It's for you to say. Go to Ironburg, talk to these planning fellows, and talk to the people. Take George with you for pictures. If there's a story, bring it back. If not, enjoy yourself. Now, let's see. Kay, we haven't heard from you. I thought you would come. Enjoy yourself. Lamber. Enjoy yourself. Ironborough. What did I know about Ironborough? What did I care about Ironborough? I hadn't seen the wife for days. This job, it's more than a job. But I wonder if there is a story in Ironborough. I wonder. Ironborough! Ironborough! All change! With plenty of time before our appointment with the town planners, so we walked. We found an industrial city, a bleak city, grown up with a mechanical heart. Factories next to the homes of those who worked them. A human workshop that, starting a century ago, had sprawled haphazard, unplanned, out of hand. So this was being altered. Dignified civic buildings still stood with pride to remind us that this city had grown when England was expanding her commercial markets. Well, it had played its part in that purpose and we'd found it not enough. The houses were built as shelters for the labor needed in industry, not as homes for human beings to grow in. Truth had broken through the steel-hard heart of Ironborough, another sign that we were stirring in Britain. So they were going to remake all this to live in. I wonder how. The address of the planning consultant we'd come to see. No ivory castle, this. One of the houses in one of the streets. Max Locke and his team of planners engaged by the Ironborough Council, had been living and working in Ironborough over a year. They were soon due to hand over their survey and suggestions. But first, I wanted to know how they worked, what they'd found out, how they'd found it. I started the ball rolling with a few questions. Fairly general yet, I had to size up my man. I asked him to tell me how this survey came into being. He explained that the local authorities were taking their post-war responsibilities seriously. He showed me some photos, done when the planners first came to Ironborough. The mayor and the town clerk at a meeting. Locke telling the Ironborough Council Planning Committee what he had in mind, and so on. He showed me his cuttings. They told me that the local press and the local people had at any rate been behind the idea of the survey. Locke said bluntly that he wanted as many as possible to be told about this, so that they would press their local government to plan against chaos. I began to feel some confidence in this man. He knew his subject. He seemed to know what I wanted. While I was getting my story, Locke had warmed up, enabling George to get some pictures. Well, I'd got the background of this story of a city reshaping itself. I'd met the man whose chief responsibility it was. 
Now I wanted to see the unit at work. Locke said, let's go to the planning room. As Locke had said, his assistants were all young people. In this room, they were putting onto maps the facts and figures collected by the research staff. On the unit were qualified architects, sociologists and economists. Everything was put down on paper, on maps. Everything from the geological foundation of the city to the amount of smoke the people swallowed. Everything from the number of rooms in each house to the number of cars that drove along their roads. The number of bathrooms. How many children in each school? How many poor and how many rich? Which streets were overcrowded? Which underpopulated? Then I began to think. More than most, we journalists are suspicious of bits of paper that promise to solve the world's headaches. We've seen too much of it. But maybe it's not the plans that have been wrong, but the people who've made them. Maybe there have got to be plans. More plans than ever, if you can only keep them alive. And these people were alive, all right. They knew very well that the facts and figures and the maps, in fact, the whole plan, were only half the battle. We still had to get the things done. Ownership of the land, for instance, is a national, maybe an international problem. But they got the facts and the figures of how the people lived at the moment. They'd put them onto transparent maps, which built up a paper city of good and bad conditions. Getting the thing as a whole, so that they could see what the next move was. Here were the existing conditions. What the people had got. And now they were out, interviewing to discover what the people wanted. Well, interviewing's up my street, so I went along to see how they were doing it. Getting busy people to express their deep wishes, it needs patience and the right sort of understanding. Had these planners any real feeling about the people out of which the figures come? Here was my chance to find out. The people who weren't experts and the people who'd become experts getting together. Mrs. Farley taking the opportunity of saying what she wanted. Having lived in the city for a year, the planners were known, were citizens themselves. That made it easier to speak to the women about their homes, to ministers of the church about the physical background of their spiritual work, to bus drivers about road conditions in the city and the homes they went back to, to shopkeepers about the position of their premises, to stallholders about the best place for the city market. Some, of course, thought there was a catch in it, thought they were being sold something. It's understandable that what they've said in the past has so often been neglected or distorted that the responsibility for finding out what they really want must rest with the person who takes on the job. Written questions worried others for a different reason. Whose business was it anyway how they lived? In areas of the town, schoolboys checked the amount of dirt in the air. And that's important with so many factories. Others made a traffic census to discover the death spots and help plan the new roads. Yes, it was a good job I came to Ironborough, for here was a story I wanted to tell. All the information from the town citizens coming in and being collated. Paper facts, but each one the voice of people, saying what they wanted. More playgrounds, more parks, more and better schools. Better sanitation, inside plumbing. Better houses. More room. More head. Haven't we got one with more head, Jenny? This is too far away. Well, there are the contacts. These are better. Yeah, much better. Let's have one of this. More action. Where are those reapings I ordered? Here they are. I was just trimming them. Hello, Grumpy. Hello, Tom. Just looked in to see how the Ironburst store is getting on. 
Well, I've had a couple of shots at it. Good. Let's have a look. That's one. This one, I think, is too regular. Yes, I think it is. What do you think of this? Well, now, that might be a bit too irregular. Mm -hmm. I thought of putting the um, outdoor surveyors here and the indoor planners there to balance it. That's it. I think it's a three-page story, starting on a facing page, with a crane picture on the right. But what are we going to call it? Mm. What about how to plan your town? Okay, let's go on then. How to plan your town. Yes, I like that. It turned out better than we expected. Makes a good contrast to the uh, Tunisian dancer story, I think. That's a good picture, you know. Island and the people. What about getting a little more emphasis on this picture? By layering and adding to the top. What do we lose? Two lines of the caption. Well, I suppose we can square the caption right up. Well, the picture is much more important, I think. You're right. That might make a good cover, you know. Yes, it might. Let's just wait and see those Spanish pictures. No cover. Still, they gave it good space. Hello? Oh, Tom. It looks like a nice issue. Don't like the cover. That Ironborough picture would have been much better. A bit dark. Anyway, I bring the runoff back with me. What? Clark Gable? Where? Southampton docks tonight? But Tom, can't you get somebody else? I might as well be a ruddy bachelor. All right. George will meet me at Waterloo. Film actors. <laughs> Machine number four is running slow. Sales are going up in Canada. Where those boots? Another in ten point girl. Catch the light train. Take George. Check. Take the pigeon. I told you. Dear sir, your article on cats is a cruel trap. Circulation one and a half million. Picture paper. All the world in pictures. Picture paper.